Just so you know. Okay, we are live. Yay. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody tonight on a happy Friday? My name is Patrick Nickel, and I am the director of programming for the Nan Ray Gallery at uh, Woodbury University. We're in the Fletcher Jones Auditorium. And tonight we are hosting the third round of the Boxing Philosophical Series of Debates. And tonight's topic is titled Experiencing Performance Art. It's a debate featuring Woodbury Professor of Philosophy Raza Ventislavov and philosopher curator Sue Spade. And tonight we have a very special guest moderator. The moderators change this is the third event and they change every time. We're grateful to have Bia Johnny Branham. Thank you very much, Johnny. Um, just a brief history regarding the boxing uh, philosophical. Um, it began at, in 2018, at least the first public performance. It could have gone on prior to that, and, you know, unpublic, um, at the ICA. And the moderator then was historian Patricia Martin. In 2019, we hosted an event inside the Nan Ray Gallery uh, during the time of an exhibition that Sue also curated, uh, What's More Real Than Flesh, that featured painters Michael Alvarez and Victoria Reynolds. And the moderator for that event was the artist Vincent Johnson. Um, so here we are, 2023, and we have Bia Johnny Branham. And I'm gonna do a brief introduction uh, on a Bia Johnny, a Johnny. Yeah. Uh, and I we'll, love the B though. Then we'll do a brief, uh, what? I love the B. Okay, I like the B too, actually, yeah. yeah. All right, okay, Bia Johnny Branham. Oh, wait, I've got the wrong bio here. Here we go. And Bia Johnny, they, them, Bia Johnny Branham is an undisciplinary artist who works between performance, writing, digital media, facilitation, and divination. Guided by a commitment to psycho-spiritual inquiry, Ajani believes the stories that structure our being in the world. Let me rephrase that. Ajani examines the stories that structure our being in the world. Ajani has shared his work at Human Resources in Los Angeles. And I love the fact that you use that tor term sharing. I think that's really kind of a sweet way to sort of speak to it. Um, the Los Angeles performance practice uh, Pieter performance space, highways performance space, online, on tabletops, in intimate conversation, and when no one is looking. They hail from Anchorage, Alaska, and as a graduate of the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities, they hold an A.B. in English and a certificate in dance from Princeton University, and most recently, a uh, Ph.D. in culture and performance from UCLA. Thanks a bunch, of Johnny, for being here. Yep. So now our two debaters are well-known and icons in their own individual profession. Uh, Raza Ventislavov is a philosopher and cultural critic focusing on aesthetics, architectural theory, literature, popular music, and performance art. His work has appeared in the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism, Contemporary Aesthetics, and the Journal of Popular Music Studies. Now to you, Sue. Sue Spade has curated over 100 exhibitions and biennials in the United States and Europe. While curator at the Cincinnati Center for Contemporary Art, and I have to put this in, over a three-year period, she curated 14 solo shows, organized five thematic exhibitions, and authored the book Echo, Echovention, Current Art to Transform Ecologies to accompany the exhibition that was also co-curated by Amy, with Amy Lipton. She is currently associate editor of Aesthetic Investigations, the Journal of the Dutch Association for Aesthetics. Her most recent book titled, The Philosophy of Curatorial Practice Between Work and World was published in 2020. And just as a nice sort of circle back to sort of the interconnections of, of this event, um, Rosin, reviewed Sue Spade's book, The Philosophy of Curatorial Practice Between Work and World, which was just published in the British Journal of Aesthetics. So I think that's a pretty cool connection and maybe, be a, who knows, maybe that will come up within the context of the debate here. 
Um, well, I think I've got the intros in. Uh, Bia Johnny. Cool. Thanks, you Pat. Go. You're welcome. Uh, hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to this event. Um, let's just jump in. We're talking about relationships between philosophy and performance art tonight. Um, so, as a way to get started, uh, I just want to invite everyone to consider what comes to mind when you think about performance art. Maybe you know a lot about it, maybe you know nothing about it, maybe you've heard the phrase once or twice, maybe you have like a very superficial understanding, very deep understanding, doesn't matter. Um, I just invite you to think about what comes to mind when you hear the phrase performance art for yourself right now. What comes to mind? Ooh, dance, sculpture, uh-huh. Other words. Live art, art. uh-huh. Uh -huh. Artist is artwork. I heard anxiety, uh-huh. Other words, uh-huh. Time, uh-huh. Lifestyle, uh-huh. Presence, uh-huh. Ephemera, Ooh, love that word, yes. Other thing. I think it's a good uh, collection of words to start with. One thing that I notice, um, especially like anxiety, lifestyle, ephemera, there's something about like um, the present, like the moment that people are in is really important to what performance is, um, which may or may not be obvious as we might talk about tonight, right? Um, also, I think when we think about the present as a more, um, in a more broad sense, thinking about uh, the contemporary and what that might be, art that's from right now, whatever that might be, um, I think both of these concerns are really core to um, what you're writing about in your paper, Rawson, um, because interestingly, you talk about the fact that um, there are philosophers who have discussed ancient philosophy um, and philosophy from other eras um, as a form of performance art. So I was wondering maybe if you could start by talking a little bit about um, connections between philosophy and performance art as you see them. And then Sue, I hear that you also have um, some wonderful counterpoints to Rawson's paper. So I thought we could start there. Um, all right, thank you so much. First of all, thank you, Pat, for this warm welcome. And thank you for everybody in the room for being here and whoever's watching online. Um, hopefully you're hearing us and seeing us. We're gonna do a little dance to make sure that you know we're coming through. Um, so um, yeah, the, uh, the this paper I wrote was kind of an instigation slash provocation, but it basically, oh well, let's sink our teeth into something preliminary before we get on a stage and you know speak in public. It's all very preliminary though, because all of us have strong opinions, and you know what, Johnny is a, uh, a practitioner of performance art in a way that I'm much less. I mean, I've, I've dabbled, right, and we could talk about it in a minute. And then Sue is someone who has curated, I'm sure, a lot of it, but certainly seen um, the bulk of it in the past, you know, 30 or some years. Um, and then, in that, s in that sense, we, we already span some kind of scale or some kind of spectrum of, you know, involvement. Um, but then my paper asked the question, is, is philosophy potentially per, per, uh, f uh, performance art? Ca can it be regarded as a performance art, right? Um, I'm well, I'm already making a, a linguistic mistake. Not a performance art, but performance art without the A, right? As in um, um, an instantiation of that particular art form. Um, well, um, I bite the bullet and say yes, right? And I give a bunch of examples. Um, and it's a strong intuition that I've been sort of rehearsing one way or another. But, um, you know, to retreat a little bit from um, thesis and strong statements, um, there is the initial sort of impetus has to do with how popular the term has been. I was recently r reading an article in um, British Vogue, Susie Menkes, one of the, their, you know, editorial uh, juggernauts, um, wrote an article about some fashion show in Milan and the title of that uh, article was, is fashion performance art? And so, see, it's everywhere. Suddenly, I mean, we talk about uh, the, po uh, the performance of politics or the performance, performance art in politics or perf uh, politics as performance art, right? And so there's this, this um, um, unease I have with how ubiquitous suddenly the term has become. 
and how little technicality or follow through there is in people's uh, conception of it, right? And then I look at philosophy for, you know, uh, well, it's my home, a, a disciplinary home, so to speak, um, and it's a good starting point for any kind of inquiry, and I realize that philosophers barely have much to say, right? And so I'm trying to do that, that, that work, and you know, the paper actually you, you and Sue uh, read was, would be, a part of a larger project, which eventually will be a book. I've been taking my sweet time with it because I'm under no particular pressure except, you know, the exertions of curiosity. Um, so, um, what I can say uh, about the, the, the thesis in the paper is I point out some of these historical examples, and Diogenes is, is one. You know, Diogenes is the crazy guy um, known as, you know, the, uh, the sort of the forefather of the cynics or the, you know, cynical school of um, philosophy. And he's been given as an example of, as a perfor uh, of performance artist anachronistically, right? Because he's not necessarily, he doesn't fall in the canon of the, of the art form as we know it. So technically, performance art has been called performance art only since the probably 50s or 60s. And there's, you know, a couple of histories of it, um, but they, you know, they mostly agree. Um, and then there's proto-performance art like Dadaism or, you know, the Futurist, which comes, say, a couple of decades before the 60s, but it's still 20th century, right? And so to call an ancient troublemaker slash philosopher a performance artist is quite a stretch, right? I mean, temporarily speaking, but also conceptually. And so, you know, I try to unpack it and to see, well, how is, well, what do we have in common? We, meaning myself and Sue, operating in the philosophy world, giving talks and, and listening to other philosophers speak. What do we have in common with um, Diogenes to begin with, but also as a fellow philosopher of a particular sort, but also with performance artists out there, right, and their practices, which also then dovetails with, um, uh, with um, Ajani's uh, glorious existence, because to be a scholar and practitioner of the, of the same thing is quite extraordinary. Um, and you somehow embody, and I do mean body, <laughs> uh, both. Um, so right back at you, how do you do it? <laughs> um, well, Oh gosh, how to answer that question. I think for me, w one thing that I love to share with students when I'm teaching is um, that thinking like everything else is a practice. Um, so if you're reading, there are practices for reading. Um, uh, well, this is, okay. When you're reading, there are practices for reading. When you're speaking with people, there are practices for speaking, there are practices for being in a room together, just like there are practices for dancing or acting or playing music or anything like this. And so one of my main uh, interests is in like the how or the tools that we use to do everything. So for me, um, whether I'm researching or teaching, I'm always asking the question of like, what tools are you using and how are you using them and like, what's the intended effect? Um, I'm sure we'll get to this later today, um, but this idea of like what performance or performativity is, this idea that everything is a practice or is practiced to some degree um, has been a really helpful concept in getting to that place. But I think that's the starting point or like the, uh, the place where scholarship and the creative stuff come together is just this idea of like practicing and then learning how to practice in different ways. Mm. Sue, I'm curious to know um, what, how you imagine the relationship between studying performance and doing performance, or like the whole prospect of philosophy and performance art, like where you stand I on that question. I think that's really good. So you were asking how do you evaluate what you are asking to do, right? Which mm -hmm. is why you why are you studying performance art? Is is there an interest that's not quite obvious that could be there? And I think Yeah, I'll just do uh, uh, briefly. So I, I mentioned that he, he was a troublemaker. The most legendary gesture, which uh, which is known to have been a reply to Plato's definition, sort of provisional definition of a human being. Um, Plato at some point says that a human being is a featherless biped. And so then Diogenes plucks the feathers off of a rooster and lets it roam and says, behold the human, right? So. I mean, w without even saying much, right? Because Diogenes was not into saying so much as he was into doing. And so he lived in a wine barrel. Um, he walked around naked. He masturbated in public. He defecated in public. He 
did it all um, in all the wrong p ways that we could imagine, right? And all of it uh, was posed as a philosophical argument. In fact, he would show up and listen to an interlocutor and then reply with one of these forceful gestures. Um, I mean, you you've probably heard that at the sensation uh, show um, at the Brooklyn Museum about 25 years ago now, um, someone um, shot a gun at a painting. This is a, the Chris Ophelis painting, and it's quite legendary. I got to see the show right after at the museum, and there was a plexiglass and two um, guards standing on the st on the both sides with AK-47s to protect the, the artwork. And so um, to shoot at an artwork, right, is some kind of reaction, but it has nothing to do with, it's not necessarily ver verbal, it's not, you know, it's critical in a, in a, in a, mm, innovative uh, or in, uh, or crazy way. I mean, it doesn't matter what you w what we want to call it, subversive. Um, Diogenes engaged in that kind of action, right? Um, for the purposes of philosophical argument. And he's considered, you know, now, intriguingly, he's considered um, kind of a performance artist by a lot of these philosophers, which I bring up in, you know, the paper I wrote. So I hope this is enough soup, right? What do you think? Um, well, I love this because it's already boxing philosophical. Um, you c I could trust Sue with, with relentless curiosity and also resolve. Um, there's a, a couple of things you said, Sue, that uh, make me bristle. And um, I think it's very, it's generative though. Um, you, s you mentioned clarity. W uh, who says that philosophy needs to be clear? Uh, was it ever? Right, and so um, someone like Diogenes basically looks at the, the Athenian society and says, "You're obsessed with a certain type of Apollonian um, rationality, and I beg to differ." And you actually uh, might learn something from relaxing that muscle a little bit, right? And so, I mean, the interplay, and you know, Nietzsche has done a lot of good work in oh, on the interplay between the Dionysian and the Apollonian, right? I mean, the messiness of assimilating into a larger communal. Uh, frenzy, which will be the Dionysian, versus the rational sort of segregation between s sciences, sentences, and human beings. Um, that was the Apollonian. Um, someone like Diogenes is the is the destroyer of the of that binary to begin with, but also of the normativity and of the purported clarity of what philosophy would be doing in the Apollonian strain. Um, so the self-congratulatory. Um, um, Icon of someone like Socrates, right? Then Plato himself, as a as a you know uh, scholar of so well student of Socrates, but also the progenitor of the academy and so forth, um, would have been very suspect for for a troublemaker like um, like uh, Diogenes. Now um, it's interesting to I think it's you know the qu the question then it becomes of what are the parameters of philosophy as a discipline and is there a place for it you know under the hood basically for that kind of insanity, right? More, more than, um, 
or as a preliminary question before we start calling anything performance art, right? It's just how do we define philosophy and where, what are its parameters? We had Sue, this, this was, was exciting a couple of weeks ago. We had Graham Harmon, the philosopher that deals with object-oriented ontology. He's done a lot of work on architecture and our conversation here at on campus was about architecture. Um, I mean, mostly, and the interplay between philosophy and architecture, what they can learn from each other. Um, but one of the statements he made is that the, the fetish of clarity is one of the most dangerous um, things about philosophy, aspects of philosophy, and also the most limiting. And so um, I tend to agree with that, generally speaking. That doesn't mean I, I do not want to make myself clear or I have no regard for clarity. But to fetishize it and to um, focus exclusively on it is to miss out on uh, uh, various forms of insight and different modes of rigor, let's say. So therefore, mm. I'm not talking, when I talk about clarity, I don't mean uh, a kind of reduction, this is true and it, nothing else is true. I, I mean clarity, I understand what that person means. I don't have to interpret it. I really don't believe that philosophy should be interpreted the way artworks are. I think Diogenes' actions, his actions call for interpretation. That, for me, already puts it on the level of art. So that's what I mean. When I talk about clarity, I only mean that it's direct, it doesn't you may not understand it at first, you may get it wrong, it may be, you may have problems um, putting it into words, but for sure, um, it, it has to have, it has a goal to be, it has a goal to be direct, it, even if it's not direct, okay. Um, I think philosophers are famous for saying, oh, I wrote something that everybody will understand, and then no one understands it, right? Yeah. So that doesn't mean that it's clear, but its goal is to be understood. Its goal isn't to, it's not, its goal isn't to obfuscate things. And I don't think Diogenes wanted to obfuscate either, but I think, I actually think because he's doing and not writing, I actually think that the meaning of philosophy is words. I know that mm -hmm. philosophy, let's say, don't list philosophy or um, uh, all sorts of things can be philosophy. I'm not so convinced because if, if you look at film, I just actually wrote a paper on this. If you write, if you have the view that film does philosophy, or that film could be a thought experiment, then you have to identify what that is, and that's a matter of interpretation. And I think that um, uh, that, that already makes it a, a kind of complicated kind, kind of philosophy. Okay. So, um, one of the things that I'm interested in about in Diogenes is the fact that he's doing, he's living, he's not, he's not performing a script, he's living his life. And, and he's living his life to show an example for us all. And I think that's really clear in performance art that there's not a fourth wall. There's no fourth wall to break. That's what interests me about performance art. It's, it comes without a fourth wall. It comes without um, a kind of, uh, it, it's right there on the same plane. As the so I, I always envision Diogenes standing right next to the temple. The people are going to the temple with or whatever people do at the temple and during BC, and he's kind of like, not necessarily heckling them, but he's getting their attention. It's a perfect spot for someone who wants to uh, get their attention. I think I'll just stop. I have more to say. Ooh, okay, so Sue, you raised many uh, really interesting points that lead to another question I have for both of you. Um, as you were just talking, there are a few phrases uh, you said that I wrote down. Um, actions calling for interpretation was one. Not doing a script, but living life was another one. And then um, no, no fourth wall was the third phrase uh, that I wrote down. No fourth wall to break, no break. uh-huh, thank you. Um, so as I'm listening to these phrases, uh, I also wrote down the words clarity versus messiness, um, premeditation, decorum. There are all these words now that are sort of floating around um, that 
maybe if they don't define what performance art is, they might characterize what it might be. So I'm really interested at this point in the discussion, um, what is it that performance art as a genre um, brings to this conversation, right? Because I think we could think about many different kinds of performance that are also asking this question, like what does it mean to be clear? What does it mean to be messy? What does it mean to be polite? What does it mean to have a script or no script? What does it mean to improvise? So I'm curious now, like what this term or this set of practices, whatever we wanna call it, um, performance art, how does it stand apart from other kinds of performance as a model for thinking? What do y'all think? Well, it's interesting because at this point we've, I mean, we've scratched the surface of the, of the uh, slightly narrow question about the difference between performance art and philosophy or continuities thereof. But now we're asking the bigger question, which is um, what are the continuities or and or thresholds between life as such and performance art? Because if you say that it's, you know, uh, some kind of response to one's environment, well, um, on the metro, you also respond to your environment. Now, that are we all performance artists? No, I mean, I'm not trying to diminish what you were saying. I'm just uh, reminding everyone that uh, that drawing these boundaries, right? I mean, when we say, okay, no fourth wall, well, yeah, I don't have a fourth wall with whoever else is in my kitchen when, I, when I'm making a meal for them, right? So now the question is, what is it specific or how, also, you know, there's, perfor there's the performance arts or performing performative uh, arts uh, performing arts yeah. performing arts yeah, sorry yeah. Uh, and then there's performance art right so there's you know how do we w carve out a space and as i said earlier philosophers actually are completely out of their depth there's two i've seen two sort of cogent approaches one is the historic which is basically hey we bite the bullet and tell you the story of how we came about in these galleries and a couple of people and here's names and you know go check it that's the one approach, which is the narrative approach. And then the other one, which is sort of more of a dimensional approach, is, oh, we're gonna uh, find these axes or these dichotomies along which performance art has been sort of developed. Uh, and so these are definitional, but they're not strictly definitional. And that's the closest we've gotten to any kind of, defin uh, to any kind of, right, I mean, clarity, so to speak. But that's fine, because maybe that's the whole point, to, to, to refuse the, the obsession with clarity and to then have a practice called performance art which is which is um, transgressive in its resistance to definitional content. This is getting me to two exciting places. One is the L Rosalie Goldberg books, you know, the many books now that she, I mean, she's sort of like the um, grand dame of um, performance art studies or his uh, histories, um, where she, in almost every book, she keeps hammering the point. Um, performance art was initially a, a response to object-based art, right? So say sculpture, right? Flash painting and everything, but you know, sculpture specifically, 
and then also theater on the other side. And he was trying to move away from both, right? So that's how she sees it. I, I, I don't think that we should uh, regard whatever she writes as scripture, but it's interesting that, um, that she um, insists on this book after book after book, right? So this is interesting. Um, but um, the other thing, which is, which is I, I guess, closer to the practice of performance arts as I've, as I've uh, encountered it, but also as I've uh, tried to dabble in, um, is that responsiveness, right, which you don't necessarily have, obviously, with theater, right, but you also don't have that responsiveness slash relationality, as I call it in some of my writing, um, uh, you certainly don't have with sculpture, right? And so, I mean, of course there is theater that breaks the fourth wall, right? And of course there's sculpture that, you know, teases, right? Some kind of interactivity. And we are getting more and more into that, you know, liminal space in, in both of those, um, you know, art forms. Um, but performance art is inherently r relational in that way that those other two s um, almost never are or less often are, right? Not definitionally, right, for sure. Ooh, okay, so. I think we're getting to uh, a point that's really interesting to me because uh, when we first started, um, what I was hearing from you, Rossman, and you, Spay, or Spade, you, Sue, um, had a lot to do with maybe not defining, but aligning performance art with transgression, right? That there's something like necessarily transgressive about this form, that, which is how I would put it. That's not what you all said, right? Now, as we're getting to this point in the conversation, what I'm hearing is that maybe performance art has more to do with relationality, right? Which may or may not be transgressive. Um, I bring this up because um, as we're thinking about like, what the histories of performance art might be, like what disciplines is it responding to, which ones did it come from, which ones is it addressing. Um, now, looking at what performance art is, yeah, I mean, you said this when we opened, like so many things mm -hmm. have this label attached to them. And some of them, um, I do think maybe transgress norms or expectations that people might have. But some of them are very much in line with what museums want to show, what galleries want to show, what people want to see. Um, and so maybe one question we can turn to, especially when it comes to performance art and philosophy, is um, what are the implications of bringing this term performance art into a philosophical discussion? And is a philosopher's job necessarily to be transgressive? Hmm. more than transgressive, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know any more what transgressive is, but I, I think that, that one of the things about uh, performance art is it is unexpected. Even if you've seen the same performance artists do the same thing before, it always somehow turns out differently, which mm. I think we would be very, it would be very odd to go to a theater piece and everything is always different every time, but performance art has a kind of irregularity that, uh, that allows it to be unexpected. Anyway, I like the unexpected. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like that term, but going back to transgression for a second, there is, I mean, starting with Socrates, who was known for, for being um, a, iconically rational and, and with, with this tremendous follow through from start to finish in these arguments that meander over the pages and pages. But he also was um, taken to court for transgression, for a putative transgression of corrupting the youth, right? So. Um, I think, I think there... Oh, no, 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 I'm not claiming. I was just talking about philosophy straight up for a second. Oh, uh, I in the... Yeah, well, no, no, no. The, the reason I, because transgression was being, f you know, the term we're looking at, and I wanted to sort of look at it from both sides, right? So when it comes to uh, philosophy, I imagine the transgression, I mean, philosophy is very often in the banned books, right, of the moment, and philosophy is also of the books of the future, um, very often in terms of, you know, sort of charting ways and uh, vanishing points for us to, you know, to think about and to act upon. Um, so, Transgressive in that sense, you know, if, we, if whatever is normative and that's a moving target, there's then the a transgression will be whatever undermines it, right? And and you're right about, you know, yeah. Right, and so so then going back to uh, to, um, to performance art, I think that, trans that transgression and uh, Jennifer Doyle and um, and Amelia Jones have done a lot of work on this. 
um, they insist on a certain visceral immediacy in performance art, and that doesn't necessarily mean bodies, you know, pressing upon bodies and outraging each other in any way or um, infiltrating each other's space, but it's something that Jennifer Dahl has called intimate publics, right? So, and we've we've actually had conversations about intimacy um, in we, we, I mean, with Jennifer Doyle on a stage at the IC ICA a couple of years ago. Um, so she deeply, she she d cares deeply about that um, the transgression of what we n well considered normative uh, uh, personal space, and uh, performance art is very often dancing around that threshold and pushing against it, if not violating it, um, and so. So I could, you could imagine then a tangent of, of similarity between philosophy and performance art in that sense because both of them are messing with us on a certain level and there is the unexpectedness of it, right? I mean, Sue, so the first time you read Paul Ricoeur or, or whoever, you don't know the damage that that's gonna cause, right? I mean, I, if I knew what Wittgenstein would have done to me, I would have never touched that book, you know? But here I am. And so, but it is the same when you walk into a gallery and Ron Athey is about to bleed out of, you know, every pore, right? Um, so um, you can't fully expect it, and that's part of the, the uh, point, but then it's also transgressive in the sense of breaking through the current normativities. Mm. Mm. All right, I, I, I'm not used to this transgression. I have no problem with it. Just, yeah. Challenging current norms, that's the perfect way to look at it. Cool. Ooh, a moment of agreement, yay. <laughs> um, keeping this line going, uh, now we're starting to talk a little bit about things that performance art explores or has been known to explore like as its own form. Um, I'm curious to know one of the questions that we have is what is it that people can or do learn from performance art um, with or without philosophy as like a, an accompanying consideration? What are some things that people can learn from performance art and why might that be valuable when we think about what philosophy is? I wanna hear from Sue on this because Sue is a formidable curator and we've had so many conversations about curating in writing and in person, um, you know, on all kinds of stages. And so I'm very excited, you know, Sue, you've seen so much performance art and you've curated it, I'm sure. Um, I'm really, and, and you care also deeply about the audience response, right? And the, and the way we gauge it and what we learn from it and the sort of the calibration of the artwork with reference to the, to the, to the, uh, to the audience response. So please, I'm all ears. I think that what we learn is our own boundaries, right? We're exposed to things. Sometimes performance artists ask us to do things. Uh, I mean, everyone who knows me knows I'm obsessed with participatory art. I'm really interested in how, I remember the first time when Carson Fuller had his flying machine in uh, the Netherlands, by chance I happened to be at his opening, no one would fly. There were there were 400 people at the opening, and seven of us would get in the flying machine and fly. And that was really, of course it was one of them, but um, it was kind of mind blowing to imagine that people, it didn't seem possible for people to have that kind of experience in our college, looking 1996. Anyway, but of course, you know, five years later, I brought the, four years later, I brought the flying machine to Cincinnati, and everyone in the room flew. So either Cincinnati has no boundaries, or I haven't changed so much in four years. But I think that, um, yeah, I think that performance art really challenges our boundaries. It challenges what we're willing to tolerate. Um, I remember once Jackie Dan Hartshock had been to a Robert Flanagan, um, oh, yeah. I've been seeing the ICA, and she was really overwhelmed by it. I don't mean to out Jackie about this, but it was a kind of an interesting. I, I never will forget Jackie's reaction to the performance of Robert Flanagan at Lace in the early 90s. She was really um, touched, really. It really it was memorable. It's memorable. A third person account is memorable. So I think this, this is the point. There's bound, we all have boundaries, and I think the performance art challenges our boundaries in ways that other kinds of, well, certainly sculpture doesn't, rarely, and then theater doesn't necessarily, because we always can detach ourselves in a way 
Um, I very much agree with this. Um, there's a performance that I've never seen, but I was told about, and just hearing about it, I ended up writing a uh, an entire conference present. Well, it wasn't a conference presentation. It was a lovely opportunity to speak at Plato's actual academy, which is a you know just an open garden in an outskirts of, of Athens. Uh, an ongoing series called uh, the Autonomous Acad Academy, organized by artists, but frequented by philosophers and all kinds of thinkers from various disciplines. So I got to speak about performance art there. I mean, this was many years ago, probably seven, eight years ago, because I was so stirred and so outraged by what I had, by what had been described to me. And I will not describe it. I will just say that it happened at Human Resources in Chinatown in Los Angeles, and that the artist's uh, name is Rocio Bolivar. I think there is something on YouTube from that, but I refuse to watch it. And I just conceptually, that's the final frontier for me. And again, I'm not going to describe it. But yes, thank you. Uh, ba the boundary pushing, right? And the sort of like the apprehending of our own limits, basically, and and um, and um, sense of of what's acceptable, what's uh, what's uh, intelligible, is a is a b uh, is very powerful. But uh, walking it back a little bit from, from Scandal and from the final frontiers that we've been mentioning, um, last night I was uh, watching a conversation about masculinities between um, Amelia Jones, who I just mentioned, she's a scholar of performance, and a um, young artist who came through the USC um, uh, MFA program recently. And the artist was, uh, was talking about how important it was for them to feel pain and to show pain in their performances. And so then, the, then Amelia asked, the, I mean, it's a blunt question, why, <laughs> right? I mean, why do we have to have the pain? Why do we have to live it as an audience, right? Or, you know, vicariously um, as it is. Um, and the artist said, oh, very simply, because I have to question it with, within myself. And the only way to question it, to quiz it, is to pitch it to other human beings and then to reflexively be able to see it from outside and then to experience it in a richer manner. So it's almost like, you know, it's the opposite of an echo chamber, right? I mean, it's, let's call it an amplification chamber, right? And so this is interesting because it's the artist's perspective. It's not, you know, I mean, because we've been talking from the outside in, right? Um, but from the inside out, it's, there's a compulsion of that, of, 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 of a funny sort that I think coheres with what that person said. I mean, I, I found it very resonant. Now. Uh, going back to philosophy for one quick, quick second, when you read something like uh, Gender Trouble, Judith Butler's uh, legendary now book, um, you are confronted with ideas and also with the limits of your own notion of gender um, in an almost violent way, right? And we, I mean, consistently we're flabbergasted about the new, new uh, self modes of self-identification and expression and the various uh, languages and epistemologies that arise uh, around them. And so that's a philosophical um, revolution, if you will. I mean, among many things, right? And there are certainly, you know, all of these thinkers. I mean, Sue, you're so embedded in the, in the feminist canon, right? And you are a feminist juggernaut yourself. Um, so you, you, know how, you know how confrontational your, one's existence can be, even when they're just trying, honestly, to make sense of stuff, right? So that artist was trying to make sense of the masculinity that, that they had to perform for their family as a, you know, queer young a person assigned as boy, right? And then, and then they're now their performance art has to have that violence because they're reperforming it, right? At, at a, 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 in that context, and then pitching it to an audience and getting some whatever feedback from that encounter is a way of um, of gaining uh, insight into themselves and the and the larger world, and also undermining again as we you know going back to transgression, undermining these larger sort of you know systemic um, issues. And so I think the philosophers do do that too. In fact, you so do it whenever you make a very strong claim about you know curating. And when I do, and when you and I brawl over it, <laughs> we get on each other's nerves in a in this sort of pushing boundary pushing manner. He's making people conscious of pain or violence because that's what he feels, and that's what he also thinks. He wants them to feel what he thinks he's supposed to feel. It sounds like that's how he's going. So it sounds very diogenous like, I must say. Um, anyway, okay. 
what was your question, Ross? <laughs> oh, I didn't have a question. <laughs> Ooh, should I ask again? A new question? Uh, a new one. <laughs> well, you're the boss. Okay, <laughs> let's do a new one. We're already moving in this direction anyway. Um, so, as someone who studies performance and does performance, but is not like a philosopher in like the traditional disciplinary sense, um, I'm curious because we've been asking like, is philosophy a form of performance art? But I'm interested in the opposite question. Um, what does it mean for performance art to be a form of philosophy? I think this has come up a few times. Um, and I ask because there are two words now that have come up a few times. One is about experience. Uh, one of the words ex is experience. And then one of the other words is reflection. And so as I'm hearing these things, I'm like, is philosophy about experiencing something and then reflecting on it? I'm sure there are many different ways to answer this question. And part of what I'm asking is, if we call performance art a form of philosophy, is experiencing something and then reflecting on it what makes it philosophy? Or are there other parts of that equation that we should know about? Well, I mean, in that, in that little article that I shared with you guys, which we haven't shared with our audience for a good reason, they don't need to read my stuff. Um, um, I mean, it's not the price of admission. We could have a meaningful conversation and kind of block it out. But um, I do uh, mention a couple of um, ways in which we could we could look at the gestural as potentially assertive in the linguistic sense. Where I mean, it's uh, just as simple as you know, um, stopping the name of love could be just like this, right? Um, and then, are you saying stopping the name of love, or are you just you know gesturing? Well, you could do both together, but you could just do one without the other, right? And I'm sure that Diana Ross has done a lot of both uh, of, of all the permutations, right, on a stage. And so, I mean, this is a, you know, a, a this is a pretty peculiar context, but um, there's the famous uh, moment in at which uh, G. E. Moore, trying to to prove that the world exists, that so the external world exists, just raises his two hands and says, "Here." And that's the argument, right? Then he says, common sense tells us that these two hands are here and you guys are seeing it and that's enough. And you can build a world out of, uh, from, you know, infer a world from this, this little piece of knowledge that we all share. And so essentially it's a gestural uh, uh, argument that he's making, right? It just, uh, he needs to raise his hands because he's basically breaching across language, breaching into the somatic, right? And so, um, so I'd say that you could imagine performance art very easily making um, um, philosophical arguments on that tip. The other thing that Bear's saying, and this is we 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 haven't even scratched the surface of this, but the um, the conversation about performativity mm -hmm. as a general concept starts with a philosopher in 1955. Um, J.L. Austin gave the William James lectures at Harvard, and he wrote a book called How to Do Things with Words, in which he explored the way we actually um, authenticate actions or perform actions through through pronouncement, through assertions, right? And so I hereby pronounce you husband and wife. I mean, that's I know that's uh, outdated, but let's just stick to the binary for a second. I hereby pronounce you is a performative utterance. It's not necessarily an assertion. Th it's because it cannot be evaluated in terms of truth and falsity. No one can raise a hand and be like, no, you're not pronouncing them. Well, yes, I am. Um, right, it's, a, it's an action that is performed through words, right? And he calls that a performative. And then he contrasts it with what he calls the constative, which is basically where you're making an assertion. For example, it's raining outside, right? You're not performing anything. You're just reporting on what, what could be true or false, right? And so he sees that distinction and realizes that the performative is a very special type of uh, utterance or pronouncement. Now eventually, philosophers of all kinds have jumped on it, including, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Judy Butler, but you know, most famously, and to, to, to the most exuberant results, Jacques Derrida, um, they picked up on performativity, on this raw sense that we could, you could take language and use it as, a, as an action and vice versa, right? An action and use it as, and run away with it completely, right? So I speak very often and I think about general performativity, where you wash 
uh, the all the di the potential differences between, and you see it more of a, a, a more as a spectrum between an assertion in language and then an assertion as gesture or as somatic um, presence. Mm -hmm. I mean, how I'm I'm curious how it is for you because I mean, oh. a Johnny's practice is very very uh, very ver uh, uh, verbally engaging, but at the same time somatic, and sometimes there's a dissonance between. I mean, it's sort of like um, imagine that you're cooking, but you're you're telling people about eating instead of cooking, right? And I'm back in the kitchen, sorry. Um, um, so it's that kind of dissonance that I've seen you perform, and I mean, most recently in the in a performance uh, art piece, I guess, um, or suite um, that was titled Trouble. This is only two weeks ago yeah. or less. Um, and so that dissonance and then the bridging of the two is something you play with very f in a masterly manner. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned this because I'm really interested, Sue, to see how you answer this question. Um, <coughs> so a lot of what I've learned about performance, like in an academic context, it hasn't come from um, analytic philosophy, but it has come from a lot of the continental stuff. So like people who are working in France and Germany um, people who are working in different strains of feminist thought, um, a lot of people who are doing like gender and sexuality studies. Um, and so a lot of these folks, some of them engage with analytic philosophy, but a lot of them are not so interested in performance as a way of philosophizing, but like performance as um, discourse, which we won't go into that whole thing, right? But this idea that, um, performance embodies are, they, they articulate messages or they have messages encoded onto them and then they also like um, re-inscribe or reinstate these messages with the difference, which is uh, I think uh, one way that Butler defines performativity or performance, one of those, I forget. Um, but I say that because like a lot of people, they may say, well, I don't know if performance is a form of philosophy, but it is a form of discourse. It does say something or it does help us imagine bodies in different ways. Um, and so sometimes I've wondered, well, is that philosophy? Is that doing philosophy? Do I really care? Does it need to be? But I think this relationship between doing something and then trying to explain it or not and having words and action kind of go like that um, is really interesting because the friction and the sparks are what uh, leave something for people to go like, what was that? Huh, I'm gonna have to sit with that for a moment. Yeah. But Sue, I'm curious to inter like I'm curious to hear what your angle is on these things, especially if, as Rosin says, you have a lot of like investment in more feminist discourses too. I'm not gonna just necessarily bring up feminism, but I'm gonna I want to start with your basic question, the relationship to your yeah. experience and reflection, because that's exactly what I'm always thinking about. So um, in terms of I think the best philosophy is based on experience. I think the best mm -hmm. philosophers, they do the best work when they've had experiences that when they reflect on it challenges and it goes against what other groups have, what other philosophers have written. So I think as philosophy goes, it's extremely important. I I'm not a big fan of philosophers who just talk about things that they never experienced. And yeah. It seems it seems disembodied, let's say. I'm very interested in people's real experiences affecting their real ideas. Okay, so on that level, uh, I do think that it is a performance art piece where um, that the performance art piece maybe creates the expression and the experience of the viewer creates reflection. It's very, that would be a philosophical response, mm. for sure. I have no problem with that. That I don't think philosophy is only something philosophers do. I do think um, yeah, I do think that your philosophical, your philosophical response has to be something coherent and, you know, that made me think of this. Okay. So on that level, getting back to discourse, I think, uh, it's interesting that they use the word discourse. I think that e what would be clear to me about our, our performance artwork is it still needs to be interpreted. You asked the question, what was that about? It's a very logical question. That's what we ask ourselves at every moment when we're experiencing art. What was that about? And I have the world's most basic definition of our art. And our work is something that urges to be urges you to interpret it. Mm. That's my art. That's my most very basic 
definition. So if you ask yourself, what was that about? Even if it, you know, wasn't even in the context of an, of an art show or something, I, it probably counts as an art. All right, so um, I, I, I have no problem with the idea of encoded messages. I wanted to, um, to take this in another little direction because some of you have read um, Alvin Noah's book, Strange Tool, Strange Tools, excuse me. Anyway, but Alvin Noah is someone who has really tried to argue that there's a relationship between philosophy and art. And he says, um, he says the job of art is philosophical. He says art is a philosophical practice, and philosophy, however surprising this may seem, is an artistic practice. This is because both art and philosophy, superficially so different, are really species of a common genius whose preoccupation is with the ways we are organized and with the possibility of reorganizing ourselves. Simply put, our works are important tools since they help us to make sense of ourselves, and since philosophy does something similar, it too must be art. So that's Alvin Noah's view. Um, I'm sympathetic in a lot of ways, but um, I still think that art needs interpretation, and a good philosopher might be difficult to read, but we're not really interpreting philosophers. Anyway, okay, well, I'll just I'll stop there. That's you know, uh, Sue, if, if I may just jump in, I, there's a philosopher who I uh, cherish, uh, Stanley Cavell. He was at Harvard in the 50s, 60s, up to the almost, well, to 2000s, and he passed away a couple years ago at 97, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he's been known to be very difficult to read, right? So it's you, it takes an interpreter, and which is why it's also, what is it? I'm very happy for, for you <laughs> and, my, and myself, <laughs> Sue, because I happen to be in that very small number. But I've also seen people leave lectures and um, call bullshit on the entire enterprise. He's famous for, for a sentence that starts one of his books, which is 200 words. And it just goes on and on, and it makes perfect sense once you unpack it. Um, but um, the reason I mention him is not because he's difficult to read. It's more about how auth autobiographical um, his philosophy always was, right? So he is a good illustration. His, his philosophical autobiography, one of two, was called uh, Little Did I Know, which is such a tease when it comes to living a, having lived a life, but also having lived a philosophical life. Um, I mean, his very first book was called uh, Must We Mean What We Say? Right, again, a, quite a tease. Um, but um, one of his books is on, uh, on 1950s comedies of uh, cinematic comedies of her marriage. That's very niche, it's right? The divorce, <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'm going through a divorce and I'm looking at these remarriage uh, movies, right? Comedies, Preston Sturges and such. And here I am uh, writing a philosophical book about it. I think that uh, the later Wittgenstein is one of these, also one of these uh, philosophers that bites the bullet and, and becomes more um, autobiographical. In fact, we in my philosophy of architecture class, we read um, a paper that um, this uh, architectural historian and theorist wrote about Wittgenstein and how building a house for his uh, sister in the middle of his career, in the middle of his life, actually changed the trajectory of his, of his philosophy, right? So this is where autobiography becomes philosophically tangible um, in the work. Um, and it, she's not the only one that has read that much into the into the sort of the, the architectural hiccup in his um, <laughs> in his career. Um, the point is that yes, you know, uh, ideally uh, experience should inform. I mean, Sue and I have have been, and this is we we sit on the on the same side of the bench uh, on this one. We've been exasperated in the world we inhabit, which is mostly analytic aestheticians, right? So philosophers, analytic philosophers that speak, uh, philosophers that talk about art. We've been exasperated by how many people allow themselves to write about art they've never seen. Mm. It's insane. It is insane. Including installations, right? I mean, installation art is what <laughs> needs to be inhabited, at least for a second or two, right? I mean, but yes, someone would just write a paper and or a book chapter. Um, um, you probably have thoughts about the uh, life and scholarship of Adrian Piper. Uh, we. We have had we have we've uh, had a specific uh, sort of niche type of kind of travesty in one of our um, in one of our panels on Adrian Piper, where someone wrote an entire paper without having experienced the work that they were critiquing very vehemently. Sure, I mean I feel like that happens all the time with performance. Like, yeah, 
not to go into it too much, but like thinking about like the gendered expectations that set up how people often think about performance in terms of like, actually Alva Noe is an interesting example because he was touring with a choreographer, Deborah Hay, who I've worked with, and they came to UCLA when I was there to do a talk, and UCLA is one of the few schools in the world that has like a dedicated dance studies program. And people tore him a new one when they went to see this talk. They were like, you don't know anything about dance and you're writing all these books about dance and talking to choreographers, like what is that? That's a, that's a whole other thing, but um, yeah, I find people write about things that they have not seen often. And I think the idea is like, well, it's, it's a performance, it's self-evident what I'm seeing, um, which I don't think is the case. Could we bite the bullet and engage our audience? Sure. Because I think it's about that time. I mean, yeah, yeah. you were supposed to run things. So if you had any. So I, I have like one last thing I want to share. Um, and it's sort of related to what we were just talking about. Um, I forget which Stanley, it, maybe it's Stanley Kevill, but maybe it's Stanley Fish. I don't remember. But one of them um, writes in one of his books, he's talking about um, aesthetic judgments. And he's basically saying that often when people are trying to explain why something is good or bad, they explain it. But explaining something is not the same thing as like evaluating it. Or like explaining something to people doesn't uh, give a sense of why this thing is supposed to be good or bad, right? Um, so I think that goes well with this quote I wanted to share. Um, it's by a performance artist who's also a professor and a writer. His name is Matthew Gulish. Um, and he wrote this book called 39 Micro Lectures, which they are micro lectures. Um, and one of them is about not philosophy, but criticism and performance. So I wanted to share this and see if um, you, Rasen, or you, Sue, have any like closing thoughts based on this. And then we can take questions from the audience to end. I'm not sure. I think it was a Stanley, but don't quote me on that. I, I think it, it is Cavell. I think it is Cavell because Cavell is obsessed with that issue. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, more to read after the show. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I'll share this quote, and then I'm curious to see um, what closing thoughts y'all have in relation to this. So it's about criticism again, not philosophy per se, but criticism. What is glass? Until recently, glass was considered a mostly transparent solid. It behaved like a solid. If struck, it shattered. But then, in the ancient cathedrals of Europe, it was observed that the tops of windows let in more light than the bottoms. A simple measurement proved that a window of once uniform thickness had grown thicker at the bottom and thinner at the top. Only one explanation exists for this phenomenon. Glass flows in the direction of the pull of gravity, exhibiting the behavior of a liquid. Thus, one cannot conclusively define glass without the inclusion of time. As creative and critical thinkers, we may find it rewarding to attempt works of criticism, which, over time, reveal themselves as works of art, thus following the example of glass. Yeah, what do y'all think? Well, I mean, you, I, I guess if we go back to Diogenes, this is what, what this is saying is that someone we thought of as a philosopher might actually manifest uh, in our in, my, in our current imagination much better and in a much more fruitful way as a performance artist, not to the exclusion of, of, of philosophical heritage or engagement, but you know, in a in a newly generative way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I I love the I, when we talk about uh, 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 interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or what I've heard for the first time in my life tonight, undisciplinarity, which is uh, Johnny's own self-identification. Oh, I've heard it from other folks. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, I hadn't before, but yeah, lovely. Um, when we, I mean, all of these er erasures of these boundaries are basically um, that story about glass. I love it. Yeah. So I'm excited. And again, I mean, to even to even come together here, we must operate on some assumption of pluralism. And this is partly in what we read, but it's also what we practice, and also what we are pursuing as a kind of a chimera, if you will. Mm -hmm. Sue, thoughts? I didn't, I didn't really want to pluralism. Okay. Um, no, I like, that, I like that lecture, or the micro lecture a lot. I think it's very, the element of time, of course, is important. Time changes, I mean, over 
your time, everything changes for sure. Yeah. But actually, that brings me back to what I think is valuable about art and why um, why I'm not an intentionalist and why yeah. I'm not interested in uh, interpretations that are that last forever. I'm very interested in the concept that all artworks are related to the present and not because of how they were in the past and then how they are in the present. So I'm mean, not the one Maybe the artworks are like glass. They're um, being pulled by time as, being, as opposed to being pulled by gravity. Mm -hmm. They're being pulled downward or pulled forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that point too reminds us that even when we talk about the present, in performance, like what that present is and what it means, it's always changing. It's never one thing. Um, and there's endless presence, which is great. Cool. Let's take a breath. For yourself, just take a breath. Um, I'm sure people may have reactions, comments, questions. So if there are questions that folks have, um, Pat has a microphone. There? Sue, so can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, by the way, I just wanted to acknowledge the amazing Nancy Evans painting th that is behind you. Um, <laughs> you texted me the title of it, but um, a really good painting by hers. What's the title of it? Can you remember it offhand? It's Painting Human from 1922. Okay. All right. I have a, I just, I'll start off with a, hopefully a question that makes sense. And I, I couldn't help but think about this idea of contemplation because time has been part of the discussion also in regards to performance. And you know, you can go to a museum, you can stand in front of a static object, you can maybe have some space around you and dig in and, and as much as you want or, or move on, stay as long as you want. So there's a thing of time involved with that. But performances generally have, you're in a room full of people. It's a very active, dynamic environment. Um, can you contemplate in, in when you witness a performance? Or I guess it goes back to the definition of what, in fact, is contemplation. And I'm going to stop. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Most of the contemplative space is when things are happening during the experience. The experience somehow gets um, emblazoned in our memories, and then we try to make sense of it later. So it's actually extra experiential. It's not experience. I, for me, those kind of contemplations. But also, in addition, um, I'm much more interested in the Vita Activa than the Vita Contemplativa. Whatever. For me, contemplation. Yeah, we have to contemplate a lot if we want to write and think about things, but I'm more interested in the experience, the activity. Mm -hmm. anyway. I, I like this phrase, extra experiential. Um, I think it points to a lot of what I think about performance. Um, I think instead of saying extra experiential, though, I'm really interested in how a present moment is connected to past moments and future moments. Because, um, like, the same, we've had the same body since we showed up here and we're gonna have, I think, you know, we're gonna have the same body until we leave here. So like seeing these resonances or like seeing things in performance, I'll talk to people they are like, this reminded me of something that happened to me like five years ago, you know? Um, it's interesting to sit with those resonances and like, I don't know if contemplation is the word I would use, but when a moment in performance helps you sort of like time travel in a way, there's something interesting about like this assistance with uh, understanding another moment in life in a new way because of this like present activity. That's kind of cool. Does that make sense? I just it's extra perceptual, not extra. Uh, cool. Perception through your experience. And I totally agree that artworks trigger all sorts of mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. thoughts of every kind, every kind of different experience. That's one of the most valuable things that our books do is that they they keep us in a reflective mode. They keep us remembering and thinking and engaging the past. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. I'll have a very brief thing to uh, thing to say. Um, there is no place in the world where anti- a- intellectualism is as fetishized and as popular as it is in the United States at this p- current moment. And it disturbs the hell out of me because I've lived in um, dark times in on the other side of the world uh, known as you know, proper communism. And so uh, why do we have an anti-intellectual bias? Because we separate the intellectual from the somatic, because we fetishize contemplation and separate it from whatever else we do. And I think that we're all on the same page from what I'm hearing from Sue and from Ajani, that these are not separable, um, this is a false dichotomy and it's also very harmful, right? I mean, to have two presidential candidates and to prefer the one that um, speaks in a less articulate manner um, means that you're pulling towards a fantasy of the somatic and the earthsy uh, that has nothing to do with the fullness of human experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Pat. Uh, are there other questions or comments that folks might have? Hi. Hi, Sue. Nice to see you on the screen. Um, and Rosson for inviting me and Johnny. I am not well versed with philosophy, but <coughs> I'm trying to follow up with the conversation. And I think that um, when I think of performance art, uh, is um, awareness. Uh, whether if performance, I think what Sue has mentioned uh, is more not based in theater, but in sculpture, um, does that mean the piece needs to have a la- like either a lack of awareness or a hyper awareness? And I think the reason I say awareness is it doesn't maybe give um, a, a direct projection from like viewer to audience but it's like around or like oriented around um things and so is i think when i think of theater and um there's a very clear orientation at times versus does performance not need orientation um may just open up for everyone to discuss you know, I've thought of modes of, oh, okay. Um, Sue, you go, please. No, all I'm thinking is if you use my model of sculpture, and sculpture's already in the round, right? It's already, it's dimensional, you walk around it, you choose your pose, you choose your angle, you choose your stance. And I think there's something about that um, in the performance art, even if it's, someone on the stage, you're, yeah, you are somehow choosing, the audience is choosing their perspective in a way, in a way that's very different than theater. So your, your, your hunch that the, the orientation is different, I think is very correct. No, I was just going to say that, you know, but think of sculpture as opposed to performance art, right, and, and, and the potential continuities is you could say, well, a sculpture could be very actively uh, confrontational, right, and in, in, in relational, right? It could also be moving. I mean, I'm thinking of Jordan Wolfson's uh, um, monster person that d- dances uh, um, across from a mirror and is mirrored, so then you're, you're implicated visually but also somatically because it's the c- sculpture is unnervingly um, realistic. Or um, Maurizio Catalan's Hitler, Little Hitler, right? Where there's a little boy in the corner facing the wall on, on their knees. And when you walk around, you realize this is baby Hitler, right? With the mustache and everything. So at that point, right, I mean, there's, it's, a, it's an entire choreography. And, it, and it, it, it could, you, could call, you could call it performative. And I, I'm, I'm willing to say that, to th- that it is. Um, but there is, as Sue, I agree with Sue on the... On the um, the scriptedness, so to speak, of, spa- of s- uh, in terms of space making specifically, of this central sort of node of interest, which, I- which would be the object, and then the potential circulation around it, um, be it circular or not, right? Whereas with performance art, there's a randomization of, um, of uh, movement and of circulation and of also of sp- uh, spectatorship, 
which is where re relationality pushes against the limits of the space. It pushes the limits of ob objecthood and um, our visceral sense of safety and so forth, right? So it maybe we see them on, the s on a scale, right, rather than uh, across some kind of threshold. Yeah, your question and also these comments are reminding me of the Michael Fried essay where he talks about um, sculpture, like being theatrical and like I have to walk around it and it's bigger than me or smaller than me. Like this whole thing of like I have to make a choice about how I'm gonna perceive what's happening. Like when I think about especially like postmodern dance and how it was happening at the same time with a lot of these people who were making the sculptures um, that were sort of like sitting in space in ways that urged people to walk and look and move toward and away in certain ways. Like, a lot of that dance and performance work was about the same thing. Like, how are you choosing to look at this? Like, how are you positioning yourself in relationship to me? Um, yeah, so I think this implication of audience is a big, like, really important ingredient uh, that sets performance art, maybe not apart from other genres, but that kind of defines it. And I think we said that earlier in the talk, too. Cool. I was yeah. thinking I was, but oh. so I I was trying to engage someone in the audience. So Justin Stato, who's here, um, has been working on a sculpture which is very, I mean, it's a it's a timepiece among many things, but it's also a sculpture, but it's also a piece of uh, temporary architecture. It's a folly, and you're a fool. Um, but um, I thought of it because it's it does so many of these things that we were speaking about, and it's just you know a couple hundred yards from where we are right now on campus. I would like to say I loved how you used the word awareness. I thought to me that sort of encapsulated a lot of uh, ways to think about a lot of other things that were being spoken to. And so nice with that. Okay. Mariana Pometnis. So I'm, I'm interested in, in this idea or the, maybe the dangerousness of the idea that a discussion and performance could start with sculpture. Um, I think immediately what I wrote down was if, um, does that then demote the body to plastic? And uh, then do you get artists who are extraordinarily pro problematic? And the first person I thought of was Wolfson. Um, you know, it, when we do that, does it detach ourselves from lived bodily experience in a way that could be potentially very dangerous or terrifying? Ooh, so I, I want to jump in on this one. Um, I don't remember if we talked about this over email, but when I first heard about the talk, one of the things I thought about was this article by Coco Fusco about the other history of intercultural performance. And one thing that she talks about in this essay is often when, you know, people like Rosie Goldberg, for example, are talking about histories of performance art, they start with the Dadaists and the Futurists. And then, you know, this whole thing about sculpture and painting and dematerializing the object, and blah, 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 right? Like, that's the whole conversation. But Fusco is like, well, for centuries now, there's also been a performance tradition where folks from um, the Americas, from Africa, from South and East Asia have been like taken from their homes and placed on display for people to go and watch. So like if we take that into consideration, then how do we define performance art? And I think um, the sort of like sculpture story and the intercultural story, like they intersect in a really disturbing way. Um, and so one thing that I've thought about a lot, especially as someone coming from concert dance, which is all about like plastic form um, is like, well then what does it actually mean to be performing for and with people? Um, yeah, I think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. For me, when I use the analogy of sculpture, I'm thinking of living sculptures. I'm not thinking um, anything in like plastic, yeah. I don't know, I'm, thinking, I'm not thinking of anything that's not Fleshy. I'm thinking something that's, I mean, the, 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 the observer will be able to know what's happening next. It's more, this is unexpected, which is something we don't necessarily do in sculpture. What's the Jordan Wolfson that she really found? I don't know that sculpture. Well, I was, yeah. I, yeah. It, it's like a, it's like a performing sex robot that sort of humps the wall. I mean, and it, the first time I saw it, I thought, you know, everybody was kind of, it was a, a spectacle that people were laughing at. So it kind of went viral as an image. 
And the first thing I thought was this is a, a just a, a way, a proxy image to demean women. It, it reminded me very much of the um, images, the Svedka vodka images of the sort of sex bot that was selling vodka at the same time. Yeah, I guess, the, I mean, the, I'll just quickly say that there's the danger zone of objectification is also um, a zone we tease and we play around with. Um, and so, beca because the limits of, the of it continue to be redrawn. I mean, when we talk about uh, presence and keep a seat at the table, we're also talking about visceral exposure to potential objectification, right? And Coco Fusco is very, very hip to that, tr to that sort of unease. As I mean, she's done performances where she self-objectifies, which is also the case with um, with Adrian Piper, especially the early performance work, um, precisely to then tease that boundary yeah. and to to make a, um, a legible problem out of it performatively. making a distinction between rituals that are public and participatory, even if they're done every year the same thing. I, would, I think that's kind of performance art. I really would have difficulty saying, no, that's not performance art. I would say that's a collective performance art, rituals. And rituals are what's wonderful is when people, you don't even have to explain the ritual. Everyone has been doing it for so long, they know what to do. And yet it's always different, and yet it always is Sometimes it's meaningful and sometimes it's not meaningful. So this is the low-hanging fruit for me. Um, a symposium is where a bunch of philosophers got together to drink. Symposium literally means drinking together, right? And so the Plato Symposium is these philosophers staying overnight, drinking all night, um, and talking about love and giving these um, speeches about love. Well, um, a couple of years ago, uh, I and a couple of other philosophers performed a symposium on love at the Night of Philosophy in New York at the Brooklyn um, Public Library. And I'm pleased to report that we were also drinking. Yes. I got to speak last, which means I was the most inebriated. Um, so speaking about rituals, we could very easily also say that you and I seeing each other at conferences, Sue, is a kind of ritual. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, you know, like I think the ritual and performance topic, that's what I'm thinking about a lot. Um, that should be the next session. Um, but let's do one last question. I see someone has the microphone. Hey, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to the very beginning of the conversation and how you were talking about Diogenes and um, and um, the story about the, the plucked chicken was great in, uh, because it, it brings about this idea of this, this thing that you could, um, well, you could think of it as art or philosophy, but um, I guess I was wondering if you could actually separate the the performance from or the artist from the art in a sense. Like maybe Diogenes is not an artist, but what he did was art, and maybe so maybe uh, it's more about the interpretation of it um, rather than um, the person performing it. So the person performing it can also reflect on it and consider it art, but at the same time it's up a, it's a, it requires the, the viewer or the, the other person to like confirm that. And so it's not necessarily uh, the right or the job of the artist to define something as art. Yeah, the operational definition in, in art history uh, for, for the kind of thing you're describing is outsider art, where you're not fully uh, aware or you're not fully invested or intentionally invested in what other people might decide to call art. Now, that's a disturbing term because it, of course, you know, sets up a boundary and what does it mean to be an insider artist then, right? Um, but I think, I think it's productive to, to imagine cases where before an art form has even been articulated, 
um, through scholarship and historicizing, um, it could be um, engaged in, right? And so retroactively, it could be through the lens of history or genealogy, we could uh, acknowledge it as, you know, as, as belonging, whatever practice belonging to, to, to an art form that we now have an articulation for. It's like a slant step that, like, I think Joseph Buys and a number of artists in the Bay Area, you know, looked at this art, ob this object that was a, a step stool that was slanted, obviously not used for stepping on anything, and they couldn't make sense of it, so everybody did riffs on it. Um, and then later on, I think they figured out it was just like a squatty potty. It was like something that you used um, to the go to the bathroom with. But, um, but at the time, they just riffed on it because it had this quality of, of art purpose. And so it was the viewer who engaged it as art, and that's what's important, not necessarily I mean, it's great if the artist has intention beforehand, but um, it's not required, maybe. I would say that um, there's no doubt in my mind that diagonals did not think he was making art. I mean, they wouldn't have been considered art. Uh, a close chicken wouldn't have been considered. I mean, he was in, yeah. So he doesn't think he's making art. And, and absolutely, in retrospect, I'm interpreting what he did as making art. He thinks he's like, um, it's a kind of a pun of anything, right? If he's he's uh, he's expressing this idea of what humans are and articulating it in a different way or visualizing it in a different way. But um, there are a lot of philosophers who, like I mean, I was a student of Dante's, and Dante was asked, Dante would have said, "It's not art because in 300 BC it's impossible to make. That's not no one considers that art." But I don't have that view. I think that it's possible to unintentionally make art. It's impossible to be unintentionally an artist. It's impossible to do all sorts of things that have different ideas or values. And of course, this is what Socrates was making fun of, that the, that the artists didn't know what they were doing. This, this is why he has to go and drink the hemlock, because he's making fun of this aspect of, of artists and orators and poets, where they're somehow unable to account for what they're doing. And to me, that's already a really interesting split. It, for me, that it totally makes sense that the artist doesn't know what they're doing. They're doing what they're doing well, not they need to know. It's the philosopher who needs to know what they're doing. And that was what my initial split was, this kind of issue of clarity or uh, coherence, or whatever you want to call it. Socrates is condemning people who are unable to speak clearly about what they're doing. Calls them idiots. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't thank everyone enough. I mean, it was really great conversation. <laughs> um, and uh, before we go, uh, I want to give a big thank you to Brandon and James, the IT crew. I mean, put out the word and you guys responded. It's unbelievable. Thank you so much. Um, so that'll, that concludes the end of the third round, experiencing performance arts. So round four, we won't throw out any dates yet, but it's out there in the future somewhere. Um, <laughs> and I look forward to ho hosting it again and inside the gallery and Sue, whenever you're in town, I'll always know anyways, just stay in touch. <laughs> um, thank you everybody, be a Johnny, awesome job tonight. The moderator is a really wonderful sort of aspect of the continuation of the series because it changes every time. We can't thank you enough. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, Razan, I'll see you around campus. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, y'all. Thank you for being here. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye, Sue.